This is White Coat Investor Podcast number 169, Rick Ferry versus Paul Merriman on Factor Investing. I want to introduce today's sponsor, Guideline, a 401k provider on a mission to help people save as much as possible when saving for retirement. Their investment portfolios contain low-cost Vanguard funds, which are automatically rebalanced to keep it diversified and on track for retirement. And the best part, no added AUM fees, which would typically take a chunk out of your retirement savings year after year after year. Check them out at guideline.com slash WCI. All right. Thanks for what you do. What you do is difficult. Uh, I remember this yesterday during my shift, went to intubate a patient. And of course, we're all wearing spaceman suits these days when we go to intubate somebody. And um, of course, naturally, it's a difficult intubation to start with. Entire mouth and pharynx full of white froth. And I'm trying to see through my goggles and my spaceman suit and and breathe. And we can't hear anything because we got wind rushing past our ears from the pappers. And, uh, and naturally, uh, the intubation gets difficult at the same time to make it uh, very challenging. It's a good reminder the medicine's not easy. Luckily, the patient did okay. Um, and, uh, and hopefully, we'll make it out of the ICU as well. And then, of course, at the end of it all, the COVID test comes back negative and you realize you did all those precautions that weren't maybe necessary anyway. Um, but, uh, that stress of not knowing which patient comes in the door that actually has had COVID until you've already taken care of them definitely adds some difficulties to our lives these days. So those of you who like me are on the front lines, stay safe and, um, take those precautions. You don't want to bring this stuff home to your family and, uh, thanks for what you do. It's not easy. Our quote of the day today comes from David Swenson, the chief investment officer of the Yale, um, endowment portfolio, who said, ironically, upon acquiring sufficient information to assess the skill of an investment service provider, individuals end up empowered to take control of their portfolios and make their own decisions. There's a lot of truth to that. When you know enough to, uh, to properly choose an advisor, you often know enough to do it yourself. Anyway, lots of things going on at the White Coat Investor right now. We are in early stages of preparing for another White Coat Investor convention next March. We are taking applications for speakers. If you would like to be a speaker at WCICon 21, you can sign up at whitecoatinvestor.com slash speaker app. I expect this is going to be at least a somewhat competitive process. And so you got to fill out a few things there and what your talk would be about, etc. Um, but I'm looking forward to having a great selection of fantastic speakers and encourage you to apply. We're also still raising money for the White Coat Investor Scholarship. You can donate to that. 100% of the proceeds we raise go to students to help them directly reduce their student loan burdens. Uh, you can donate at whitecoatinvestor.com slash scholarship donation. We also could use some more judges for that contest. Remember, they all submit an essay and uh, we have three rounds of judging. And so we need a fair number of judges in order to help us choose the winners for that scholarship. We've taken our staff out of the process completely. So we are not judges. Uh, we need your help uh, to decide who's going to, to win the cash of these prizes. Also, thanks to those of you who have been participating in our promotion. Uh, we've been titling it with the hashtag, hashtag live like a resident. We're basically helping you celebrate if you have paid off your student loans. So as you pay those off, please submit a picture and your story at whitecoatinvestor.com slash debt free. And we'll help you celebrate. We'll publicize uh, this and use your story to inspire others to do the same. If you know Peter Kim, the passive income MD, you know that he has a real estate course. And the purpose of his course is not to teach you how to do direct real estate, but to teach you how to invest in passive real estate. He teaches you how to uh, evaluate syndications, evaluate private real estate funds, really know what a fair uh, set of fees is, what a good waterfall is, how to evaluate uh, whether this particular sponsor knows what they're doing, etc. If you're interested in that course, you can get on the wait list between now and the 31st of this month. Um, so you can sign up for that at whitecoatinvestor.com slash P-R-E-A, Passive Real Estate Academy, whitecoatinvestor.com slash P-R-E-A. There will be a discount for those who are on the wait list. They'll be offered a discount if they buy the course between the 31st of July and the 2nd of August. Between the 2nd of August and the 9th of August, you can still buy it, but you'll have to pay full price for it. So that's the point of getting on the wait list. So you get an email that allows you to have, I think it's a $200 discount on the course. And of course... 
uh, it comes with a money back guarantee. I think you can get through the first two modules and still get 100% of your money back. So no risk to you. Try before you buy. Uh, check it out if you're interested in private real estate investing. All right, today we have a couple of really special guests. I'm sure you've been looking forward to hear from, to hearing from. Uh, I'm going to bring them on and introduce them once I get them on. Today on the White Coat Investor Podcast, we have two very special guests I'd like to introduce. Our first guest is Paul Merriman. He began his career as a stockbroker. He's the founder of the Merriman Financial Advisory Firm, also the founder of something he's a little bit more passionate about, I think, the Merriman Financial Education Foundation. He's the author of four investing books, leader of more than a thousand investor workshops, the host of the weekly Sound Investing Podcast, a speaker in our most recent online course, the Continuing Financial Education 2020 course. Welcome to the White Coat Investor Podcast, Paul. Thank you, Jim. Great to be here. Our other guest uh, also probably needs a little introduction for most of my audience. He's been on before as well. This is Rick Ferry. As you'll recall, he's been a Marine fighter pilot, uh, also started his career after that as a stockbroker before founding a low-cost advisory firm. He's also been an adjunct college professor and now an hourly fee consultant. He's the author of at least seven books, a speaker at WCICon 20, uh, the host of the Bogleheads podcast, the president of the John C. Bogle Financial Literacy Center, and I understand a very talented pickleball player. You got it, man. <laughs> I'm getting better every day. Welcome to the podcast, Rick. <laughs> Thank you. So together, these two gentlemen, these two opinion leaders have affected the investing views of literally millions of investors. That's a scary proposition and a weighty responsibility to think that other people base the decisions they make with their serious money on your opinions. Is that ever scare you to think about how many people listen to you and, and consider your opinions? Well, well, I can tell you if I can start here, Jim, I, I, it's a huge responsibility. And the, as you know, the challenge we have is that we don't know the investor. We know about investing. We know about all of the different kinds of mutual funds. But at the end of the day, successful investing is more about what we know uh, inside of us so we're kind of flying blind, and that's the biggest limitation, I think, as a, as a teacher on the internet. Yeah, I'd have to agree with what Paul says, because we, when we write and when we talk and even presentations like this, we're speaking to the average investor, yet there is no such thing as an average investor. Everybody's different. So what we put out is geared towards the middle of the road, but I've yet to meet anybody who consistently drives down the middle of the road. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, it, it really is, a um, when you get to strategy, which is different than philosophy, and we can talk about that, uh, strategy is very personal to each individual. And uh, I think that it's uh, important to differentiate. I think that's very helpful. So the first part of this podcast, and I suspect this is going to be broken into two podcasts. I'm just going to warn you right now, both these gentlemen have plenty to say on these topics, and we have 40 pages of questions from listeners, uh, not all of which we are going to get to today, obviously. Um, but we're going to try to divide this up so that the first podcast we do here is going to be all about factor investing. And I think we ought to start with a question that was submitted on Twitter from FI Physician who asked me to ask each of you to define what you mean when you say asset class. <laughs> Go ahead, Rick. All right. Well, Paul and I have already discussed this <laughs> topic, but um, to me, asset classes are very broad. You have stocks, which are common equity. You have real estate. You have fixed income assets. And then, and then from there, you can divide it into subclasses, such as U.S. stocks versus international stocks. And to me, those subclasses are mutually exclusive. There are no U.S. stocks and in international stocks. And the bond side, you could say treasury bonds versus corporate bonds and mortgages, so that these sub-asset classes are, again, mutually exclusive. But to me, asset classes as a whole are very broad. Stocks, bonds, real estate, cash, commodities, and that would be it. I would, uh, 
I would drill down uh, beyond what Rick does and and also include what I think you would consider a sub-asset class, uh, something that like small cap value. Uh, that's an asset class that there's a lot of evidence, a lot of research has been done to track its uh, risk and its return. And so to me, the S&P 500 is just another asset class that has these characteristics that lead to certain historical returns and certain historical risks. So I have a, a bigger list of what I would call asset classes, but you know, at the end of the day, it's that portfolio that Rick would put together or I would put together that uh, it doesn't matter whether they're sub-asset classes or they're general asset classes, they're still going to be chosen because of these characteristics that they carry to make it hopefully a more profitable and maybe a less risky portfolio. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is let's just get a definition up front. Let's start with a definition of total market investing. Now, let me give this to you, Rick. How would you define total market investing? Total market investing, if we're talking about the U.S. stock market, is the universe of stocks that is available to the investor. Now, it doesn't mean all stocks. There are stocks that are not available. Private equity is not available, for example. Or some small micro cap stocks are generally not available. Stocks that are Mark Zuckerberg personally holds at Facebook are not available. So the it's the universe of available investments, available equity investments to uh, anyone, any individual investor uh, would define the total U.S. stock market. Okay. And uh, Paul, you want to define for us the term factor investing, if you will. Well, the, and, and maybe the, distinguish between how that differs from total market investing. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the factors are simply, these are groups of equities, let's say. Uh, and these equities have something in common. It could be the size of the company. It could be how growth oriented, how value oriented. In theory, you're looking for factors that are going to give us a premium over, let's say, the S&P 500, or certainly in the beginning, the, the, the most important factor in terms of the big payoff is going to be the decision to go into the stock market. That, that is a life changer for investors, and, and literally a multi-million dollar decision to use the factor of the market versus the fixed income even the riskless fixed, in, fixed income like the, the treasury bill. So when you talk about the total market, typically you talk about a cap weighted index. In other words, each company is going to have a relative value in that index that is based on the size. So that yes, you'll have some small companies in the total market, but they are so small in terms of their of, of the multiplying the number of shares times the price in the market. They hardly have any impact on the return. As a matter of fact, going back to 1928, the return of the S&P 500 is virtually the same as the total market index. And yet the total market index has small cap and small cap value and all of these other factors, but not enough to make a difference. And so what some of us are fighting for is in a sense, but we want more small cap. We want more value represented in that total market index. So we're lobbying for a different percentage breakout of these different asset classes, rather than by capitalization, which means 50 companies, 50 companies are going to drive a big part of what you make as an investor. That's a big difference from this approach of looking at these factors and breaking the portfolio down into 
some individual pieces that really are not represented fairly, of quotes, fairly uh, in a total market index. Okay. So some people look at diversification a couple different ways and they say, well, the more companies you own, the more diversified you are. So the most diversified you can get is to own all of them to invest in the total market, buy a, a total stock market index fund, for instance, and own all the companies as maximal diversification. A factor investor tends to argue that it's not so much that diversification that matters as your diversification between the factors. And I would like to hear from each of you on which of those you feel is more important as far as diversification goes. Oh, so I'll start out. So clearly, as Paul pointed out, you're Exposure to beta, which is the market, is the most important factor that you can invest in. It, it explains more than 80% of the return of your diversified equity portfolio, your exposure just to the market. And if you're just buying a total market index fund, it explains everything. But if you're going to do factor tilts as well, where you're going to have value and you're going to have momentum and you're going to have uh, quality and size, uh, small cap and so forth, it still explains more than 80% of the return of your portfolio is whether you're actually investing in stocks or not. So uh, that is uh, the number one decision. By far, the overwhelming decision that you make, it is the cake. And what Paul is talking about is the icing on the cake and sometimes the flavor of the icing on the cake. The cake is whether or not you invest in stock or not, and 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 I think that uh, the the reason that a lot of us are are wrestling with this factor question uh, because the reality is, if all you owned for the rest of your life was the S and P five hundred, uh, John Bogle would be very proud of you, and and <laughs> and he would say. You know it's okay because you've got great companies, and you got uh, you 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 have companies that are financially more secure than some of those companies you're going to end up with in a portfolio that's adding some more value and some more small cap. But at the other end of the spectrum is though there are those of us who see the holy grail as figuring out. How could I help somebody earn an extra one half of 1%? Because an extra one half of 1% compounded over a lifetime during the accumulation, during the distribution, can be literally over a million dollars for somebody. And so if there's an extra half a percent, by, by balancing the portfolio, Equally, for example, I have this thing called the ultimate buy and hold strategy. It's my ultimate buy and hold strategy. It's not Rick's. It's not yours, Jim. But I hope whatever you have, you could say that's my ultimate strategy, which is the best I know. But that strategy is built with equal parts of the S&P 500 and large cap value and all of these other factors so that the portfolio is more balanced. It isn't dependent upon 10 companies or 50 companies to, to, to get us to our whatever our goal might be. It's dependent literally on the 12, 14,000 companies that my wife and I have in our portfolio. So that's a very different ap approach to how you expose yourself to equities. So this concept of tilting towards small and value stocks kind of comes out of research done by Fama and French published in the 90s, where they went back and looked at basically all the stock market data we have. The best data set goes back to perhaps 1927 to the 90s. And of course, it can be extended to today. And looking at that, they determined that small stocks and value stocks had higher returns than the overall stock market. So the question, knowing that investing, knowing that finance is not physics, you know, this is not something where we can put it in a lab and test it over and over and over again. We have a limited data set. So the question is, is factor investing real or is it just the product of retrospectively data mining a limited set of data? We will let you know in about <laughs> 50 years. <laughs> 
it's hard because the, the problem is once the data gets published in academia, and especially when someone wins a, a Nobel Prize for it, uh, which Gene Fama did, at least part of his research, um, everybody starts doing it. I mean, it, it, it in many ways could potentially just dilute away whatever factor benefits there were. We certainly saw a tremendous surge in factor investing in the, the mid 2000s um, with ETFs and all kinds of uh, small value factor related ETFs coming out of all different types of factors, the factor zoo, if you will. I mean, Rob Arnott came out with the term fundamental indexing, and then there was this term smart beta, which was a great marketing term. Um, doesn't mean it's actually smart. It just means it's different than beta. And, uh, and it got very, very crowded. The trade got very crowded. And, uh, and ironically, maybe because of this or maybe not, the factor premiums went away for a long time. And if you look at the small cap premium, it literally hasn't been there since the first research came out. I believe it was, and Paul, you can correct me if it was in the uh, 1980 timeframe, where uh, a lot of the data on the premium of small cap actually was first published. And since that day, there hasn't been a premium. So it's, again, ask me in 50 years if this is all going to work. Well, I'm not going to last long. So <laughs> I'm going to have to take a stance here that uh, people, again, will know after I am long gone. Factor investing has never worked the way people thought it would work. That is true in the real-time application, and that is also true looking at the historical data that the people like Fama and French looked at. And let me tell you why, why I think this is so. I know the way I present it, and I don't know if Rick does it, but we look back to 1928. We look at the return of the small and the large and the blend and the value. And what do we see? This very neat relationship, the S&P 500 at 9.9, .9, the large cap value at 11% compound rate of return. Small cap blend is about 12%. Small cap value is about 132 So what do we know? We know that if you add those other asset classes, you're going to make more money than the S&P 500. So people do it. The problem is they don't realize how badly factor investing failed even when it worked. And the greatest failure of all was a guy who discovered something that today we take for granted, and that is Lawrence Edgar Smith, an economist who, who wrote a book in 1924. It was the first book that made the case that stocks paid a premium over bonds. That was not commonly known, at least by the public. So he became a hero. His book was a big seller. And what happened after he became successful? He even, I think he started a mutual fund. It eventually failed because just as he made the case how this factor, he didn't call it factor, of the market was better than fixed income, the market failed. And the same thing happened. If you look back at the 1930 through 1949 period, large cap value fails. If you look at the 1950 through 1974, small cap fails versus large cap, and, 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 and value worked over growth. If you look at almost any long period, it turns out that all these things we believe about factors on a relatively short period, and Rick and I would both agree that 25 years is a short period of time. I think you'd agree, Rick. And, and, yes. and yet, over 25 years, these things fail. And what do we know about the last 20 years? The S&P 500 made less than long-term government bonds. What's wrong with that picture? So the, the nature of this process is we don't know whether we'll get the premium in the future. 
The academics believe we will. I believe we will, but I can almost guarantee it's not going to be the smooth ride that people would like it to be because it isn't a science. It isn't even an art necessarily. It's unknown, the series of returns that we're going to get. And that's the challenge. Let me quote somebody to just sum up what Paul just said. So I'm going to quote Paul, by the way, (laughs) letting you know. Paul said to me one time, we don't know the future, but we have faith in it. And and I I think you've just seen that uh, from him. (laughs) I think it's a great quote, by the way. I use it all the time. My mother wanted me to be a preacher. (laughs) On a dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. Yeah, you better believe it right now. (laughs) So let's assume that it is real. That over the long term going forward, small and value stocks are going to outperform the overall market. And let's move forward with that assumption. Is this historical outperformance as well as this performance moving forward, is this a behavior story or a risk story? And if both, is there a way to quantify how much of each? And if there's no way to quantify it, what's your gut sense for how much of each explains the premiums? You want to take it first, Rick? Well, if it was a behavior story in the past, first of all, I personally believe it's a risk story. You're investing in small cap stocks, you're investing in value stocks that have low growth, uh, high uh, debt. I mean, you know, they're they're kind of crummy companies when you when you look at them, <laughs> especially like energy stocks right now and so forth. So there's there's more risk there. And so therefore, since there's more risk, there should get a higher return. That's that's the value side. And then on the small side, you've got the again, smaller companies don't have the ability to finance like large companies do. They pay more money uh, for capital, whether it be equity capital or fixed income capital. If it's equity capital, uh, then that means you should get a higher rate of return. So to me, the story of small cap value is a risk driven story. And the uh, behavioral side of it, where it may have actually happened in the past, perhaps, and it could be happening right now with uh, these technology, large technology stocks collecting all the money uh, and leaving small value aside, if you will. It that maybe isn't going to be as strong. Maybe that story isn't going to be as strong. I mean, we know that the premiums have dr- shrunk, uh, and maybe it's on the behavioral side. I don't think it's on the risk side. Well, I I do think that there's a a very important aspect of the timing of the process that could have to do with behavior. I know, for example, from 1995 to 99 that the S&P 500 compounds at 28.5% a year. And when surveyed at that point, people predicted that for the next decade, that the compound rate of return of the S&P 500 would be somewhere between 20 and 30%. Now, I'm thinking about behavior in here. What's going on here? According to John Bogle, at that point, people through Vanguard were selling the values funds and going into the growth-oriented funds. This, again, sounds like behavior. So I think a lot of the money, not all of the money, but I think a lot of the money is going to come, just like with dollar cost averaging, if, in fact, we're dedicated to rebalancing taking from the rich and giving to the poor uh, when prices go up in one part of your portfolio. So is it true that when the stock market is down and I keep putting money in there, $100 and buying more shares of the unwanted companies with the belief that it's coming back in the future, that that, a lot of that is behavior and that behavior will drive at least some of what happens to the pricing in terms of the timing. But, but the bottom line is, is that we're going to fight with people forever, trying to convince them to stay the course with whatever reasonable strategy that they will accept today. What I'm seeing is people challenging the value part of the portfolio, both large and small, 
and saying, isn't there something better we could do? Isn't there something that would look like what just happened and would have been better for me? And I remind them, there is no risk in the past. We always know what we should have done. <laughs> and, and, and that behavior, the behavior has more with the return that people get out of these factors than what happens to the factors themselves. Now, I got a question from somebody on Twitter, calls himself uh, Bring the Pain. Uh, I think it's an ophthalmologist based on their handle, but uh, this question's for you, Paul, and I think you may have just answered it. He wants to know what your logic is as to why the small cap value premium still exists. And it sounds to me like you think it's both a behavior explanation, people not wanting to buy those stocks because they're not the sexy Google and Facebook stocks, as well as the risk issue that Rick illustrated so well. If we look back at times when the market is under serious negative consideration, people really worried about it, those out of favor companies can get hit pretty hard. Now people, I'm not surprised people are looking not just because of the technology run, but to the S&P 500 for stability. Not so unlike what happened in 2008 when government bonds went up a lot and corporate bonds went down and in some cases a lot. And that's because there was a rush to quality. We may be seeing the same rush to quality in the S&P 500. I remember in the late 90s, I was a terrible investment advisor because for the five years from 95 to 99, our all equity portfolios compounded at about 11% while the S&P 500 was making almost 30. And people were asking, you know, how come we're paying you 1% to, to help us make less money than we could have? It's always what, what we could have done. And what did we hear from the press? The small cap value, the small cap premium is gone. The small cap value premium is gone. It's a thing of the past. And what happened for the next 20 years? Small cap bland and small cap value way outperformed, as did large cap value, the S&P 500. So I don't see where the evidence is that it's dead. It may be resting, but the fact is that I think, I think Rick is right. It, the built-in premium is about the risk that people are taking. And if you do not get a premium for small companies, why would anybody invest in them? Because that, that risk, we know it's there. Why does the bank charge me more interest than they do Bill Gates? Because I'm riskier. But you know what? I'll pay. And they'll make more money off of me, although it'll be a very little bit, than they will loaning money to Bill Gates. So I think that risk premium is going to be there. What the academics, when you press them, will say, it may be very small or it may be large. But from 2000 to 2019, it was large. I, I, it, was, I, I, it wasn't large from 2010 to 2019. It was, too, it was very large from 2000 to 2009. And then it fell apart. But, um, <laughs> Particularly in the, the last uh, year. Uh, 10 years, actually. It's, it, but, but these things are cyclical. I mean, they go back and forth. If you really look at it, we're talking about industries. Uh, you know, we, we, we get all bogged down on value versus growth. I think you really got to pop open the hood and look at, you know, what are you really talking about? You're really talking about the differences between a growth index and a, uh, excuse me, a, uh, technology, healthcare, um, communications, uh, heavy weighted U.S. equity market, which is a which are you know, growthier, if you will, industries versus brick and mortar industrials, um, energy materials, which make up a lot of the value uh, side of, of the equation. So, to me, when I when I'm comparing value and growth, I'm really comparing differences in, in industry weightings. And, and you could see them in even in the industry weightings between U.S. stocks 
and international stocks. And sometimes we talk about, well, you should be more diversified into different countries by, by using international stocks. And that's true. But why? Well, because if you look at the underlying industries, they're value industries. It's, it's manufacturing, it's uh, energy, it's um, materials, it's, it's uh, consumer cyclical stock type industries. And this is what makes up value. And, and we have here, like it or not, we have times when tech and growth do really, really well. And then we have times when the other stuff does very, very well. In fact, in the 1980s, uh, manufacturing and industrials were doing very well and international outperformed the US and value outperformed growth. In the 1990s, it was exactly the opposite. We had technology doing very well with the uh, dot-com bubble and so forth. And, and lo and behold, uh, growth outperformed value in US outperformed international. And, and then in the next 10 years, 2000 to 2010, we had a flip-flop again. I mean, technology did very poorly. Communication did poorly. Healthcare did not do well. But industrials did well. Manufacturing did well. All the things kind of uh, value we did well. And value really outperformed growth and international outperformed U.S. And then in the last 10 years, we had the exact opposite again. We had technology doing very well. Communication, which would be Google, and by the way, and Facebook are communication stocks, not technology stocks, and neither is Amazon. But these things all put together did very well. Healthcare did very well in energy and industrials and materials and commodities did not do well. So um, value underperformed growth. And lo and behold, U.S. stocks outperformed international stocks. What's going to happen over the next 10 years? I don't know. I mean, if, if technology doesn't do well and energy comes back and industrials come back, uh, materials come back, uh, it, then value will outperform gr uh, growth again and international will outperform the U.S. So this is just what goes back and forth. So uh, to me, I tell my clients, you don't really need to do a whole lot of value investing if you actually have, say, a third of your money in international stocks because it's already value investing. It's, it's a little bit different approach than and maybe not the direction that you wanted to go here, but it is a way of getting, in a sense, what Paul is talking about without actually buying value, a value fund. Well, I think there's a lot of good sense there. I mean, I mean, they are different companies. They're different companies, different industries, different sectors. When you look at, uh, particularly when you look at a small value uh, index versus a, a total market index. Absolutely. Yeah. I, so, I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to doing value investing, but I don't know if you necessarily have to actually buy a value fund to do it if you're a global investor. That's all I'm saying. I try my best to keep the do-it-yourself investor that we're trying to, we're asking them to be calm for the next 40 years or 50 <laughs> years if they're actually a real buy and hold investor and to have a glide path at some point going to fixed income and all of that. My challenge is I try to stay away from the story of investing, what's going on inside of those industries. I totally agree that if you go back and track all of that, it isn't just about the outcome of small cap value. It was what was going on with those companies. But the minute that we encourage people to start getting involved in the kind of the story of how this all works. It starts to be a little closer to Jim Cramer than I want to come. And 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 so are you accusing me of being Jim Cramer? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. You did a good Jim Cramer though. <laughs> uh, but but the but if we if we just get them to realize it's just a different way of owning the whole market. It is not weighted to the size of the company. It is weighted to these magnificent, historically, asset classes that if you owned a little bit of each one of them, in our case, it's 10% each in 10 different asset classes, you're not calling the next winner. You're saying that if value is better than growth, I've got it. If growth is better than value, I've got it. If big is better than small, et cetera, I've got it. And I can quit thinking about what should I be doing next? Just 
be happy owning the entire market, but in a different way than you do, I think, Rick. All right. So I think we all agree that if you're going to tilt a portfolio toward factors, it needs to be done for the long term. How long is the long term? Well, rest of our life. Yep. I'll agree with that. Okay. I'll go with his answer. (laughs) But it's certainly not 10 (laughs) years or even 20. No. So if you're going to like, it's a lifelong investment strategy. When people ask me how I've done as an investor, I tell them to contact my wife after I'm dead (laughs) because we don't know until the last rock is turned over because who knows what we're going to run into in the next 15 years. I'd like to, I'd like to keep doing this as long as John Bogle. He's kind of my hero in this regard. I want to keep teaching as long as I possibly can. So let's say that is another 10 years legitimately. 10 years, as Rick said, that's a very short period of time. It's statistically not meaningful. But try to tell somebody in the family that was inheriting the money in that last 10 years that it wasn't a meaningful 10 years. Yeah, it was a meaningful 10 (laughs) years to them, just not to the academics or the market. Now, the top five largest stocks in the total stock market index right now are Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet or Google, and Facebook. The FANG stocks, I guess minus Netflix, which is number 21 right now, um, these top five stocks, uh, a lot of people would call them tech companies. Sounds like Rick would call several of them at least communication companies, but they make up 18% of the market. While that's technically not a tilt, that's an immense amount of a portfolio to have in just five mega cap growth tech stocks, isn't it? You got it right. You're asking me? (laughs) It's not like we haven't been here before. I think that if you look back in in the history of the US stock market, you'll see that it started out with the railroads were basically the entire market and then banking became the entire market. And then uh, eventually around energy companies, if you look back uh, 50 years ago, Energy companies were the entire market. And then Ford and General Motors were the entire market. I mean, so this is not unusual for, you know, one industry or a couple of industries and a couple of big companies to become the market. But despite all of that, uh, as Paul was saying, the S&P 500 still compounded at whatever it was, 11% per year. Now, I don't know if it's going to be that way going forward. But despite that, uh, that this cap-weighted index, which has a few big companies in it that overwhelms the index at the moment, still did fine. And by the way, it's fake news, the S&P return. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry I did. I shared fake news when I said it was an 11 per, well, the average 40-year return of the S&P 500 of all 40-year returns is 11%. But mo- since 1950, I think the, they became the S&P 500, in 1957, and prior to that, all of this work that's been done is hypothetical, mostly by the academic community, as far as I know. And then when you look at the return of the S&P 500, where the heck is Tesla? I mean, d- does it really represent our our country when, when we don't have Tesla in the S&P 500? Well, there's a way you get on the S&P 500, and they haven't qualified so far. But here they come, possibly getting on the S&P 500 just in time to hurt the S&P 500. Now, when I say that, I'm not picking on Tesla for a second. But academics have traced the returns of the companies they threw off the S&P 500 compared to what happened to the, you know, to the S&P with that new company coming on. The companies that were thrown off generally value companies, by the way, those companies made more money in the long run, according to the study I saw, um, than the S&P 500 itself. So there's a lot of things about that index that may not represent the the real story. It's really meant just to be an approximation of what kind of a uh, of a premium we should get for being in equities. And I'd be curious if I may ask a question of Rick, Jim. Is it okay? Yeah, absolutely. Great. 
What when you talk about an equities position, what premium over the risk-free T-bills do you expect that our investors will get? So first, the S&P 500 is one portion of the U.S. stock market. I I generally don't invest in the S&P 500, invest in the total stock market, which is all 3,700 stocks. So that's number one. Just want to clarify that. Uh, Yeah, so over T-bills, you're looking at 5% premium over T-bills for investing in the total stock market. That's historic. Yeah. So today, if T-bills are zero, (laughs) you're looking at about a 5% expected risk premium over that. So in a sense, the return of the stock market over the last 20 years has not been terrible. It's been terrible in, in, in nominal numbers. But when we risk adjust it, it is not a terrible a return. Well, if you inflation adjusted, yeah, that's true. And it, yes, yes. You know, it's interesting, this FANG phenomenon we've been seeing the last, oh, five years or so, five plus years with these big tech companies. What similarities and differences do you see between this phenomenon and the years with the dot-com boom and bust? And perhaps, in my opinion, also with the Nifty 50 era of the late 60s and early 70s. Can you compare and contrast our era today with with each of those? And and which one do you think uh, our era is more similar to? Mm. Yeah, so I'll I'll jump on that. Um, We are nowhere near the uh, dot-com bubble of the late 1990s. The the PEs are not even close to what we were at in the 1990s. That was clearly a, a bubble. And it, it, was not only large cap, it was not only a few tech companies, it was all tech companies, uh, even tech companies that just came public, uh, half-baked uh, companies uh, like uh, eToys and and uh, just a whole slew of other ones. So we're nowhere near the valuations that we were at in uh, 1999. Now, we're closer to where the valuations were at with the Nifty 50 back in uh, Jerry Sang and you know, that, that area back in, I guess you could think it was late the 1960s era. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the valuations of tech stocks got higher, the Tron stocks, so to speak, I think they were called. But um, so we're closer to that than we are, than we certainly closer to that than we are in uh, the 1990s. And I think the lesson for us, uh, if we think of the Nifty 50, and as, as one of you said, uh, they became a. They came around in the late '60s, but they really didn't become uh, available to the public in terms of a popular thing to do until about I think 1972. And what we know is, and that list includes I think Sears, and it includes GE, and I suspect I don't, I don't know that General Motors was on that list, but uh, a lot of companies that today haven't they haven't done very well. And I suspect that will happen again, that uh, a, a broad diversified portfolio or index like the S&P 500 may do again to the techs today as they did to the Nifty 50. You did better in the S&P 500. You did better in small cap value. You did better in large cap value. You did better in small cap blend than you did in what was perceived the 50 stocks that everybody could buy and put away in their lockbox and uh, and and not have to think about it because they were of such great quality and had such great futures. That, I think, probably is still true today. My next question, I think, might be a, a little bit more interesting. I got several questions like this from the uh, listeners and, and readers on the various forums perhaps uh, most concisely said by Vagabond MD on the White Coat Investor Forum. He basically said, Paul, are you still backing up the truck with small cap value? And Rick, when are you going to back up the truck with small cap value? I can Uh, answer that. (laughs) (laughs) All right, go ahead. Now, wait a minute. Back back up the truck. Let's define back up the truck. (laughs) 
Yes, I have recommended backing up the truck in an article that is entitled How to Turn $3,000 into $50 million. Now, in order to turn $3,000 into $50 million, you back up the truck for the newborn child and you put the $3,000 into small cap value. They're not going to need it for a while. Then as it grows, and by the way, you don't have to do it with $3,000. You could do $365 a year for 21 years, the same outcome. Is it possible that the S&P 500 will get 10% over the next 100 years? Is it possible that small cap value would get a premium and make 12%? I don't know either one, but I do know this. That $3,000 growing up until that child, let's say, is is uh, 21, and you start using the proceeds to be put into a IRA, a Roth IRA, and you just let it go until they reach retirement, it could literally turn into $20 million in income, and at age 95, a $30 million gift to the rest of the family. All it takes is a 12% compound rate of return. Would I back up the truck and fill it up with small cap value for that newborn child? You bet I would. I think I think that's that that is not. Uh, uh, I think it's an okay thing to do. I encourage it for grandparents to do that. I have backed up the truck for my our own portfolio. We are half in small. Half of that's in small cap value. We are half in large. We are half in U.S. We're half in international. We don't play any favorites. We just like to believe that the team players are working for us for the long term. Oh, by the way, I'm also half in fixed income, but I'm 76 years old. So, yeah, we're still backing up the truck. And... We'd love to hear it. I hope Rick will drop me a line when he. <laughs> well, let me oh, let me uh, let uh, me uh, give uh, a follow up question to Paul before we turn to Rick. Okay, y- you've been steadfast as a small and value tilter for a long time. However, due to terrible small and value performance, particularly in the last year, a tilted portfolio has now underperformed a total market portfolio for something like twenty seven years, back to the time that Fama and French first published widely on the topic. Has that given you any hesitation whatsoever on recommending this strategy? And if not, is there a time period over which you would say, I was wrong about small and value, tilting a portfolio is a bad idea? When Gene Fama was approached and asked the question, do you realize that your small cap blend asset class has underperformed large cap blend? His response was, you're not very patient, are you? There is nothing. As as a matter of fact, when I talk to my university students, uh, I I encourage them. I hope that the first 10 years they invest, that whatever they invest in, as long as it's an index that has a history of doing well, I hope it goes down. I, I don't like it going down, quite honestly, because because I'm, I'm in the last years of my life. But for the young people who are dollar cost averaging into a 401k plan, I am not worried for the long term. The small cap value asset class underperforms the S&P 500 going back to 1928 by 15%. When I say underperforms, the difference in return, sometimes better, sometimes worse, is 15% a year. It is not unusual for it to to, to underperform uh, the the total market. That is not unusual. What we don't know and none of us do is what the future will bring. I think there are people today who are now considering investing in international markets. And I'm not making this in a political way. I'm just saying that there are people who are saying, hey, you know, you know something? It may be that other countries are going to uh, learn how to deal with the problems of the future and be as successful as the U.S. And so they are expanding into internationals. We're already there. 
I am I have not been hurt by small cap value nearly as much as I have by my position in international securities. Now, Rick, let me turn to you for a minute. More and more each year, there's this sense among bogleheads, among others that listen to you and read your works, that you've been backing away a little bit from small and value tilting as a great strategy for investors and leaning more toward a, a total market or a three fund type portfolio. Why is that? What has changed besides recent performance? And uh, I'll give you an example of one of the people asking this. Livesoft, Livesoft, the most uh, prominent poster on the Bogleheads forum says, small cap value tilting seems to be a dead horse. Mr. Ferry has gotten off that horse, but Mr. Merriman has not. When should one get off a dead horse and why? Just as an example of, uh, of somebody wondering this, feeling like your positions maybe changed or you've emphasized it a little bit differently. What, what would you say to that? Uh, I don't know if criticism is the right word, but a sense that your recommendations have changed over the last decade. Um, I Okay, so I've had this portfolio called the Core 4 portfolio that goes back 12 years or something. There's no small cap value in it. It's just the total US stock market, total international stock market, a small slice of real estate, and a total bond market. And I think you might be familiar with the core four concept. It goes back probably to 2000 and I don't know, nine or somewhere around there. But um, I've never been a strong advocate of factor tilting. I wrote about it in my books and I showed that statistically, if you had uh, about a 30% of your US equity portfolio, if you had 30, you had 70%, this is your US equity portfolio. If you had 70% in the total market and 30% in small cap value, so 70 30 mix, that it historically gave you a higher a return uh, risk adjusted than the stock market. So, in other words, actually, you had the same risk as the stock market, but a higher return. So, I have that in the book. Um, but I've never been a I've never gone actually with the clients that I've ever managed money for, never went above when their US equity portfolio, never went above 25% in a small cap value. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but what I keep saying all, all along about small cap value is number one, you have to, it has to be something you're going to be in for 25 years, your lifetime, basically. So it can't be a, a flash in the pants. And what happened after... 2009 or so, during this heyday of small cap value with the returns of small cap value from 2000 to 2009, I believe, were the highest they had ever been. I mean, huge returns of small cap value versus large cap growth during that decade. Well, and then all of these products, of course, coming out, you know, small cap value, fundamental indexing, as I talked about before, anything at all that were any excuse whatsoever uh, to, to launch a fund that basically tilted to small cap value. I became a little, well, you know what? I mean, maybe I'm not as hot on it as I used to be now that everybody has decided they're going to be hot on this. Maybe now is a good time for me to just sort of back down from not being as aggressive about uh well, I was never really aggressive, but it just, look, I mean, in the end, 90% of your return is based on your, your equity to fixed income exposure. And this idea of factor investing, a small cap value investing is simply the icing on the cake. And sometimes it's the flavor of the icing on the cake. And sometimes it's the sprinkles on top of the icing. It is not the cake. So in trying to keep things very simple for investing, for investors, um, you have to decide how much they would have in equity, how much you're going to have in fixed income, how much you're going to keep aside in cash, and then maybe slice the equity between international and US. And after that, it's really the icing on the cake. If you want a little bit of small cap value, that's fine. We'll put as a small cap value in there. If you want some real estate in there to boost up your real estate a little bit, because real estate is a big portion of the economy, that's fine. You know, We can put a little portion of real estate in there as well. But don't focus on it. Focus on the cake. Don't focus on the frosting or the candles or all the little decorations or all the sprinkles. And that's what all this is. And that's, I guess, I've, 
best explanation I can give you. All right, so we're going to cut this podcast off right there. This conversation I had with Paul and Rick went two hours and 10 minutes. So there's no way I'm going to force all of this into one podcast. It's going to be too long podcast is what it's going to end up being. But we're going to continue this conversation next week. Not only are we going to talk more about small cap value and other factor investments, but we're also going to take some uh, non-factor investing related questions that you guys submitted on our various social media channels like the Facebook group and the subreddit and, and the various forums. And so we'll get into that next week as well. So expect that coming uh, soon. I do want to thank today's sponsor, Guideline. They are a 401k provider on a mission to help people save as much as possible when saving for retirement. Their investment portfolios contain low-cost Vanguard funds, which are automatically rebalanced to keep it diversified and on track for retirement. And the best part, there's no added AUM fees, which would typically take a chunk out of your retirement savings year after year after year. Check them out uh, at guideline.com slash WCI. Um, also, if you're interested in speaking at WCICon, go to whitecoatinvestor.com slash speaker app and apply today. If you'd like to donate to the White Coat Investor Scholarship, you can donate at whitecoatinvestor.com slash scholarship donation. Also, if you'd like to be a judge for the White Coat Investor Scholarship, please send an email with the words judge in the, uh, in the title to scholarship at whitecoatinvestor.com. Thanks for those of you who have uh, been participating in our um, Live Like a Resident promotion where we promote you and what you've done paying off your student loans. If you have done that, you can submit your story and a picture at whitecoatinvestor.com slash debt free. I also mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, Peter Kim, the Passive Income MD, his course is opening up again soon. Get on the waiting list, whitecoatinvestor.com slash P-R-E-A. If you're on that list, you will get an email offering a discount for the course. It's about a $200 discount, so it's not insignificant. Um, but you need to sign up right away. I think the uh, waiting list ends tomorrow. If you're listening to this the day it's released, it ends on the 31st of July, and then you'll have from until the uh, 2nd of August to buy it at the discounted price. As always, there'll be a money back guarantee with that. So you can try it before you buy it, in essence. Um, thank you for those of you who have left us a five-star review and for telling your friends about the podcast. Word of mouth is still the most important way we grow around here and help others to get a fair shake on Wall Street. Keep your head up, your shoulders back. You've got this and we can help. Stay safe out there. See you next time on the White Coat Investor Podcast.